I saw the new Mortal Kombat movie, and the main character who's not in the video game, brand new character for the movie, Cole Young, is an MMA fighter. And as an MMA coach, I watched this movie through that lens, looking for mixed martial arts influences in this fantasy kung fu setting to see if I could pick up any moves that I recognize and use in the fight choreography. And there are four moves in Mortal Kombat that we're going to break down in this video that you can use in the cage. Let's check them out. Round 1. Fight! The first MMA technique that we're going to break down comes from an actual MMA fight. Cole Young's an MMA fighter fighting for 200 bucks a fight, which might not sound like a lot, but when I was fighting back in the US, the paychecks were about that big. The biggest paycheck I got for an MMA fight, including the win bonus back in the United States, was 250 bucks. So this movie kind of hit close to home in that regard. When I moved out to China and started fighting in Asia, man, the paychecks went way up for professional fights. Now, in this scene, Cole's opponent gets on top, Cole's in a turtle position. His opponent spins around into a side ride, wedges his knee in between the body. This is a very technical scene. I was actually pretty happy to see how well they did this. In this scene, Cole has just failed an armbar. His opponent climbs on top, Cole turtles up. His opponent spins around into a side ride position wedging his knee in between the body to ensure that his opponent can't grand be roll out, controlling the far side arm. This is very technical stuff. It's one of my favorite positions. It's one of those positions that is not really emphasized in other sports like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because it's not a big scoring position. But in MMA, this is a make or break ground and pound position where you can TKO your opponent within seconds. In the case of uh, Cal Schwartz, she had a fight in Invicta some time ago. Uh, Schwartz versus Hansen. After a beautiful suplex, her opponent turtled up. Kaylin Schwartz moved into the side right, wedged that knee in, controlled the position, and hammered her opponent with so many strikes, it turned into an absolute bloodbath, far gorier than many of the fight scenes that we actually see in the Mortal Kombat movie itself. At this point, Cole's opponent locks up the near side arm with his legs and the far side arm with his far side arm and rolls into a crucifix position. This is a fantastic position. I made a whole video about this position and all the multitude of submissions and strikes you can pull off from this position. In the movie, Cole's opponent drops some strikes and then finishes with a neck crank. Totally legit moves. Here's how you do it. In the movie, Cole's opponent is pulling under the jaw, which could potentially work, but you'll have a lot more leverage holding right around the temple. See, hold the lever from the top rather from the bottom, and you will have a lot more pulling power. Round 2. Fight! The next move that I recognize that I actually use is a takedown that Cole Young uses against Kung Lao while they're sparring in the sand pit at Raiden's Temple. Kung Lao throws a roundhouse kick, Cole Young catches it, reaches under with his arm, rotates circling around as he spins to the ground. It's very similar to the arm spin throw that my friend Michael Holbert teaches in this video here. Except instead of circling from the arm, he's circling from a leg grab. Now you can do this off of catching a kick, or you can do it off of shooting for a single leg. Finish him. Round 3. Fight! The next move that popped out to me was when Cole Young fought Goro. Yeah, the brand new guy nobody cares about fought Goro. But he takes down this 900 pound, 8 foot tall Shokan warrior with a takedown that I actually recognized. At least I thought I recognized it. The first time I saw the movie, it's a pretty dark scene and the camera tilts around so you can't really tell what's going on on the first viewing. So I thought it was this takedown, which is one of my favorites. And I use it, I love it, here's how you do it. You get behind your opponent, you thrust one arm under the hip, and you roll backwards, carrying them over your hips. But, when I watched this again, I took the scene, I increased the brightness a lot because it's a very dark scene. I realized, no, that's not the takedown that Cole Young was using. He actually used the exact same takedown that he used while he was sparring with Kung Lao. So, 
At least that teaches the principle that you perform the way you practice. He practiced the takedown against Kung Lao. He did it live when he fought Goro. So that's at least a true principle about the way we perform the way we practice. This is not, however, a technique that I would use against a 900 pound giant monster. If you see this video, my training partner is several inches taller than me and several kilos heavier, not nearly as much size and strength difference as there would be between a human and Goro, but eh, there it is. How do you take down a monster? Plot armor. Plot armor. Final round. Fight. The last scene I want to comment on is the foot sweep, spinning dragon tail sweep that Liu Kang does repeatedly against Kano as they're sparring in the sand pit in Raiden's temple. Now, this is kind of an homage to people who like to spam the sweep while playing those old school 2D games where you would just stand next to the other guy, hit that sweep button over and over until he's dead. And eh, it's kind of funny, but if you're going to put in Easter eggs, you might as well be a lot more faithful to the source material than this movie was. I digress. Let's break down this technique. The spinning dragon tail sweep is one of those techniques that almost everybody gets wrong, including the Mortal Kombat games and this movie. It's usually taught and shown in movies, in video games, as a kick, that you kick the guy's ankles out from under him. And while that's physically possible if the guy's already unbalanced, what the spinning dragon tail sweep is, is a leg entanglement. You've got to be a lot closer than you think, and once your thigh, not your foot, but once your thigh makes contact with your opponent's calf, you must roll onto the calf and finish a single leg scissors, as shown. Yeah, the spinning dragon tail sweep, if your opponent's too far away, sure, you can turn it into a heel kick to the calf. But, in order to take your opponent down, especially someone who is bigger and stronger than you, and balanced at the moment, you've got to get that close. It's a very close range leg entanglement. And once you hit the floor, you're in position for leg locks, to take the back, and to inflict all kinds of damage. It is not a very popular sweep. Personally, I think there are better options. I use it from time to time during sparring. I never used it during a professional fight, though. And come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else use it during a professional fight. So those are four techniques that I picked up from Mortal Kombat 2021 that I actually use, that I enjoy, that I like. And if you want to stick around a little bit further, I'll give you my review of the movie. Spoiler warning. This is not going to be a synopsis of the movie, but there will be spoilers. That's what a review is. It's not a synopsis. Man, this is something I absolutely hate about YouTube reviews, is the fact that so many very popular movie reviewers on YouTube never actually review the movie. They just tell you what happened. That's called a synopsis, not a review. This is going to be a review. This review is brought to you by xmarshall.com. Use my code RAMSEY10 for 10% off everything at xmarshall.com. For fight apparel, sparring gear, and all kinds of fitness equipment, go check them out and tell them Ramsey sent you. I grew up in a pretty small farming town. We didn't have a video arcade or anything like that, but we did have a video rental store where you could go and rent movies, back when those things still existed. And at this video rental store, they would sometimes have arcade cabinets there that kids could play. And back in the 90s, they got a new one called Mortal Kombat. And man, this really grabbed my attention for a couple of reasons. One, they had digitized graphics. That was a pretty new thing back then. And there was blood. Fatalities, secret moves that only the cool kids at school knew. But what really caught my attention more than anything else was the story. If you watch the arcade cabinet between demos of gameplay, 
They would give you snippets of the story. They would tell you about the character's backstory, why they're fighting in this tournament, why this tournament is happening. Every 1,000 years, the two realms compete in this tournament to see which one can take over, and Outworld has won nine consecutive tournaments. If they win, win, win ten, they can invade Earthrealm, and, ooh, the fate of the universe is at balance. Whoa, the stakes are a lot higher than I thought they were at first. And... Man, we have stories of ancient ninja feuds, and we have stories about cyborgs and, and mercenaries and just some crazy stuff going on there. It runs pretty deep, even in the very first game, and it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And one thing that bugged me when I looked up some reviews of this movie is that everybody reviewing it says... I don't know anything about the lore or the story of Mortal Kombat, but I played it a couple of times, and there were fight scenes in the movie, there were fight scenes in the game, so... But... I'm one of those guys who played Mortal Kombat for the story. For the story, man. I thought it was really interesting. I always thought that this game would be much more interesting as a role-playing game as opposed to a uh, beat-em-up one-on-one -on -one fighting game, weirdly enough. So, a movie, what a perfect vehicle to convey the story of the film to the fans. But instead, we got a very different one. Now, I was a little disappointed, like many fans, that there, spoiler alert right here, that there was no Mortal Kombat tournament in the Mortal Kombat movie. If I had known that a movie about the most famous martial arts fighting tournament in video games would not actually include a tournament, I could have been mentally prepared for this. But man, I was like, well, when's the tournament happening? Like 20 minutes before the movie's over. This isn't a lot of time to host a, a tournament between realms. What is going on here? So there's no Mortal Kombat tournament. If you go in knowing that, you can accept this movie for what it is and be a lot less disappointed. So, what else did they change? The main character, Cole Young. Now, going into the movie, I knew that Cole Young was the main character. I knew he was not from the video games. He's, he's this new character made specifically for the movie. And I listened to the director explain something like, well, we're including this new character so that the audience can have a vicarious experience and have everything explained to them, have all the exposition dumped on them through Cole Young. Is that necessary? No. 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 You don't need exposition dumps to make movies good. But was it bad? Uh, I didn't really hate it. I didn't really hate Cole Young's character. I mean, I thought he was okay up until the end. At the end of the movie, there's this epic showdown, this epic rematch between Sub-Zero and Scorpion. They have this centuries-old blood feud. Scorpion's coming back for his revenge, back from the nether realm to extract his revenge against Sub-Zero who killed him. And Ko Young inserts himself into this fight scene. At this point, I was thinking, okay, I was fine with Cole Young up until this point. Just get, get him out of here. Get him out of here. And at the end of the fight scene, Scorpion has to politely ask Cole Young to leave. Like, okay, go away. This is my personal business. This is my fight. Go, go away. Go away. You've had enough screen time. So, anyway. What else? This movie had exciting... I was about to say, exciting fight arenas from the video game, except it didn't. The video game did not have such exciting arenas such as the back of the woodshed in the dark, and the crappy trailer home in the dark, and the sand pit. There was one scene from the movie, the, the bridge over the pit, very popular stage in the video games, where at the end you can uppercut your opponent off of the bridge and they fall onto a bed of spikes at the bottom. And when I saw the pit, I thought, ooh, ooh, 
They're going to do some fan service right here. They're going to finish with a knocking the bad guy off of the bridge. This will be interesting, but no, we didn't get that. Anyway, there were a lot of Easter eggs in this movie, like a lot of them. A lot of little things where you could tell people involved in making this movie definitely knew the lore. They knew the story. They knew the background of the characters. They knew the little nitty, gritty, nerdy details. But apparently they didn't care enough about them to make a story about them. So, the Arcana. Let's talk about that really quick. There were two things in this movie that seemed like they were stuck in here just to make it seem more like a video game than the actual video game. The dragon mark tattoos that the characters had and the Arcana, neither of which are part of the video games. Not even a little bit. But they seem like video game tropes, don't they? I mean, the, the dragon marks, for example. The chosen ones have these dragon marks, and, and if one of them is killed, then the person who kills them gets that dragon mark and becomes one of the chosen ones and then can ar unlock their arcana or whatever. That sounds like a trope from at least two or three video games that I've played, but none of them were Mortal Kombat. And then the, um, the arcana, that's the explanation of how these characters get their powers. Now, it's no secret in these video games, the characters have powers. Liu Kang can shoot fireballs out of his hands, and he can do crazy flying kicks. And Kano, because he's a cyborg with a cybernetic eye, can shoot lasers out of his eye. And Jax, because he's also a cyborg with robot arms, has robot arms that are really strong. But in this movie, they try to explain it away with a worse plot device than the midi-chlorians to explain the Force in Star Wars. Man, do you remember that? Do you remember Star Wars, the original Star Wars, where Obi-Wan Kenobi explains the Force to Luke Skywalker in a couple of very simple lines? The Force binds the universe together. It's, it's the power that, you know, whatever. And Luke is like, okay, I get it. And the audience is like, all right, we're on board with that. The Force is the power of the universe that Jedi can tap into. Cool. Got it. But then the prequels try to take it to another level by sciencing Star Wars, which isn't even science fiction. It's fantasy. Just like Mortal Kombat is fantasy. And they try to give this sciency sounding explanation of, oh, this, this guy has a midichlorian count of 754, and therefore he's eligible to become a Jedi, or whatever it is. And it just sounded dumb and weird. Nobody liked it. That's the same sort of thing that we get with um, trying to put some sort of justification or explanation of why these superpowered beings have their powers. And, I mean, Arcana. It comes from the word arcane, obviously referring to magic, and I suppose that could make sense explaining magic powers like Liu Kang can shoot fireballs or whatever. But as far as the cyborgs, robot arms, last I checked, robot arms, prosthetics come from actual science, and in the story of the video game, they do too. But in the movie, it's magic. They're magic robot arms. And Kano's eye lasers, magic eye laser. He doesn't even have the cybernetic eye. Man, doesn't even have the, the faceplate. Anyway, that was weird to me. That was really weird. If you can get past that weirdness, these weird MacGuffins, them trying to make Mortal Kombat seem more like a video game than the actual video game in the movie universe, then I suppose you can just sit back and enjoy the fight scenes. Let's talk about some of the fight scenes. The first one and the last one, Sub-Zero versus Scorpion, these are very special effects, heavy scenes. These, these are good fight scenes for the most part. There are some choppy cuts and so on, but eh, I'm fine with that as long as it looks good. I understand why they did it. Um, they were emotionally driven scenes. It, it almost seemed like these were like six-minute fan films, like high-budget fan films, and there are a lot of good ones you see on YouTube that are like six minutes long, they put a lot of time and money and effort into these, and the rest of the movie was like, hey, let's take these two fan films about Sub-Zero and Scorpion fighting and wedge some filler in the middle to pad it out into a full-length movie. 
because the first and the last scene, it seemed like that's where the entire budget of the movie went, and everything else in the middle was like, we don't really have enough money to pull this off, so let's just kind of uh, do what we can with the budget that we have. The reptile fight. At first I was thinking, oh cool, they have a fight with reptile, and he's in his reptilian form. And if you played all the games, you see Reptile. He's a, he's a ninja, but he's a reptilian, anthropomorphic reptilian character. He goes through some transformations from humanoid to partially humanoid, part reptile to full reptile in the fourth game, I think it was, and back again. So he's full reptile in this movie. One of Reptile's powers is that he can turn invisible. And you see this in the video game. It's... it's kind of fun and kind of annoying at the same time because when your character is invisible you can't really keep track of him on the screen can you? But the computer always can so there's a bit of injustice right there but in the movie he turns invisible and at first I'm thinking okay this is kind of cool they're being true to the source material here except after the fight scene I started to realize wait a minute man they sure saved a lot of money doing CGI on Reptile by having him invisible throughout the entire fight scene. We see Reptile on screen for like four or five seconds, and eh. I didn't hate it, but I felt kind of... felt kind of miffed afterward, like, man, they tricked us. They tricked us into thinking a fight scene was going on when the characters are simply flailing around at the air. Eh. The other fight scenes, oh man, one of the biggest disappointments I had, spoiler coming up here, big spoiler, when Kung Lao gets killed, yes, Kung Lao gets killed in this movie by Shang Tsung, Shang Tsung, the soul-sucking, shape-shifting wizard who never shape-shifts in this movie, we never even hear about the fact that he has the ability to shape-shift and take on the powers of... Uh, other fighters, but he never does that. But he does suck Kung Lao's soul out of him. And the big disappointment about this wasn't so much that Kung Lao died. I mean, uh, it's okay. It's Mortal Kombat. Characters are going to die. That's fine. What's not okay is that there was no fight scene before that. Shang Tsung is supposed to defeat his opponents in combat before he sucks their souls. And in this one, Kung Lao, full health, no fight scene, just, come here, whoosh, got your soul now. If he can do that, why doesn't he do that to everybody all the time, instantly? It wasn't fun. It would be more cathartic. It would make more sense if there was an epic fight scene between Kung Lao and Shang Tsung. And then, after a loss, we get the soul suck. That would have been cool. That would have made sense. That, that would, uh... It wouldn't have left me with a hollow, empty feeling after that character's death. It would have added importance and gravity to it. So, sounds like I'm complaining about everything. What did I like about the movie? The costumes were great for the most part. The characters looked like their video game counterparts. There were fight scenes. It's not the worst video game movie I've ever seen. Again, video game movies are famously bad for the most part, but... The first Mortal Kombat movie, the one that came out, when was it, 1995, 94? Not, I don't remember. The one with Robin Shaw, Lyndon Ashby, those guys. While it's not a great movie, it is a great video game movie, and I'll tell you why. Because it was true to the source material. There were characters who looked like their video game counterparts for the most part. There was a fighting tournament. It followed the story. It did take some liberties, but it followed the story. The characters fought each other. We had the fight scenes. We had the tournament. We had the, the stakes of the realms. And we didn't have goofy explanations as of why Liu Kang could shoot a fireball out of his hands. We just accepted, okay, that's what Liu Kang can do, because he can do it, right? And to date, even though, you know, the CGI is dated today... And the special effects, uh, not the greatest, fairly low-budget movie. I think it had like a, what, like a $15 million budget, which might sound like a lot of money, but in Hollywood dollars, that's, that's a shoestring budget. Especially compared to movies today, man. 
but it stands the test of time as being one of the most faithful and best loved video game adaptations or movie adaptations of a video game for the simple reason it was faithful to the source material i mean compare that with compare that with street fighter the movie that had characters that kind of looked like their video game counterparts but then that was the end of the similarities there was no fighting tournament in fact there was very little fighting in street fighter the movie i think there were there was probably a grand total of like 5 minutes of fighting in this uh this 2 hour film now mortal kombat 2021 doesn't make that mistake there are lots of fight scenes they're they're okay but there is no tournament. They do change the story. I'm going to ask you this. What was the best Harry Potter movie? I'll tell you. The first one. I'm not even a Harry Potter fan, but the first movie was the best one. And here's why. Because it followed the source material. Faithfully. Because the movie was exactly like the book, and that is exactly what fans wanted to see. They wanted to see their beloved characters portrayed on screen the same way that they were that they came to life in their imagination. And so they took a close look at those books and they made it come alive on screen. And because of that, the first film, it stands apart from all the others. Compare that with so many other movies that just spit on the source material. I mean, why were the last Star Wars movies not well received by fans? Well, it's because they... They spat on the source material. The original Star Wars trilogy, they were like, kill it, get rid of it. Like, they're literally saying these things. And they broke all the rules, they, they destroyed all the previously existing tropes, beloved tropes of the franchise that the fans had come to know and love. They subverted expectations, but not in a good way, and a lot of people were upset by this. Understandably so. Now, I understand why you have to change things for movies. That makes sense. But you don't have to change everything. Anyway, that's my review of Mortal Kombat 2021. It's okay if you go into the movie expecting the lore and the history and a faithful adaptation of the video, video game story. You'll be disappointed. If you go in there expecting a couple of cool fight scenes and some... A few neat visuals at the beginning, at the end, and some meh in the middle. You might have a good time. Thanks for watching. Now get out there and train.